Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Palumbo. I'm the host of the Palumbo Pulse, where we interview some of the most successful business owners, government officials, economists, and market strategists. Today, we're lucky enough to have with us former Senator Michael Balboni. Michael Balboni served the public in New York State for 19 years, beginning with his election to the New York State Assembly in February of 1990. He was reelected to the New York State Assembly for four times before winning a seat in the New York State Senate. He then served in New York State Governor's Office as Deputy Secretary for Public Safety and Homeland Security Advisor for New York State, overseeing 13 state agencies. Michael is the President and Managing Director of Redland Strategies. He's both the expertise in strategies, strategic knowledge to understand and react to the most difficult problems that you may face in both government and in business. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us today. Super excited to have you. Great. As I was listening to who you who you interview, so you know, successful business leaders, government officials, <laughs> strategy. I'm thinking and Balboni because I don't fit in any one of those things. <laughs> no, longer, no longer a government official, but um, Bill, thank you very much You're for having me. Man. And I really appreciate the opportunity to take, to take a little bit of a uh, a different slice of life because of your client base and the people that you work with. You know, you see the world in a very strategic way. It's always good to to see that business sense. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you again for coming on. My first question is, when are we going to get along yeah. as a government, right? There's such polarization, both sides. What do you think, you know, when you look at your background, you did great working across party lines. Everybody knows that, right? So you understood what it takes. What, what will it take for us to get back to the way things used to be where Parties used to work with each other across party lines. <clears throat> sure. One of the things that I learned early on in, in, in my career when I was in the assembly Republican minority was that you had to, if you want to get a bill passed, you had to convince a Democratic assemblyman that the idea that you had, that individual could take that, work with it, make you a part of it. That's the only way you got in passed. I was proud to say I got a bunch of different uh, statewide bills. Some they let you have, when you say statewide, it lets you have bills that affect just your district. It's kind of part of the custom and practice of the House. It's a part of the courtesy and, and cordiality of the House. But to get something that has a statewide impact, um, that, that you have to work through the, um, uh, the Democratic majority. And so I, I learned how to try to thread that needle. But then, of course, working in the Senate, that was a great uh, uh, training for that. Because what I realized, and we were in the Senate majority. We had a pretty good majority at the time. And I'd have, I'd have Democratic senators come and basically say the same thing to me that I said to the assembly counterparts. And so I was like, of course we'll work together. You know, in fact, sometimes I got in trouble with the majority who said, why are you doing this? Why are you helping this person? I said, because they're not a threat to your majority. They're not going to, you know, they, but if you help them, it's a, it's a stop. I'm not into the partisan stuff. But I guess, <clears throat> but just one last point in terms of my perspective. Please, yeah. So I win and uh, for my uh, fifth term in the state Senate. And I've kind of decided I'm, I'm done with this aspect. And Elliot Spitzer gets elected as governor. And at the time, I'd become the chairman of the uh, Homeland Security Committee for the New York State Senate. It was the first state level committee created in the United States up to 9 11. And um, so I just, all I wanted to do was, was Homeland Security. And so I called the governor after he won. Said, look, if I can help you in any way, shape, or form, fine. It eventually wound up him offering me this position of, of the Homeland Security Advisor for New York State. And I accepted it working for a Democrat. And in fact, the New York Times had a story that said, giving up his future as a Republican to work for a Democrat. And, and therefore, I never really thought either party had you know, cornered the market on ideas and solutions. And it really is about people. And, and once you get past the party, stuff it just doesn't matter having said that the reason why we are so polarized right now is is one is part process and part media the press so uh we have this reapportionment every 10 years where we go and we redraw the lines based upon how population has shifted and the parties that draw the lines are the folks that are in power so they obviously want to do is they want to build their majorities and the way they do that is they take if, if it's, say, the, the Democrats uh, in the uh, Congress, they want to maximize their members. So what they do is they put all the Democrats in certain districts so that it makes that individual unbeatable. 
Likewise, you then take the Republicans and put them in a district and making that incumbent unbeatable, right. except to primaries. So if I'm in a very safe Democratic district, the only way I'm going to lose is if a Democrat comes and primaries. And in primaries, both Republican and Democrat, what you have is the more conservative and a Republican and the more liberal and a Democrat. They're the ones that usually capture the imagination of the primary voters. And so what you have is you have incumbents who sit there and say, wow, oh, I, I got to survive this primary challenge. I better move left if I'm not left up or I better move right. right. And so you get institutionalized um, polarization. But then, of course, you've got the press who, boy, the 24 hour news cycle and the constant need for information and it's only bad news they want to talk about and let's make sure we only highlight the differences not the way people get along nobody wants to hear a good news story of people getting together that's right that's, you know, that's right. Bipartisan. so and that's the way you get on press and that's the way you further uh help your chances of re-election so that that's kind of how we got where we are today do you do you see it improving at any point yeah so after 9 11 the country came came together absolutely we did it was it was one of the you know f- most frightening moments of my my life, and also one of the most inspirational, because everybody across the walks of life has sat there and said, "Yep, we're together," you know. And it, New York was attacked. But the folks in Ohio said New York was attacked. That's fine. In fact, one of the most um, moving, and if, if if your audience hasn't gotten a chance to to watch this, they really should. There is a video of the um, in in Buckingham Palace of them playing the Star Spangled Banner. Wow. And, and on, you know, the, the days following 9-11. That right there, you know, the symbol and, and the togetherness. Well, obviously, you know, it shouldn't just be crisis, but that's the reality. That crisis. Is reality. So, unfortunately, absent that, I think that, that it, we're just on this partisan train. And, um, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just the way the system has been set up. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of more recently that football player that hard stopped in the middle of the field. And I just felt like at that moment, until we found out that he was going to be okay, like the whole country came together as one. Right. And you kind of felt that. And you're right, like September 11th was the other time that we all came together as one. And we all felt that. And it's such a great feeling. And it's just a shame that it, this has to be this fight between satisfying the left, satisfying the right, and, and you can't just really come together. But, but Michael, if you had to say, right, what percent of the population is hard left and what percent of the population is hard right? What number, what percent would you throw on that? So uh, over my career, I've looked at a ton of polling, uh, obviously for the elections, but also for issue identification, things like that. And, and here's the, 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 the cold truth. Most Americans don't care about politics. They just don't. Is that right? They want to on with their lives. You know, it, it, they don't, don't overtax me. You know, make sure I can get on the road and drive to my work or get on a train. Uh, you know, make sure my kids get educated. Uh, let me live my life. That is the majority, the vast majority of Americans. So in terms of the hard right and the hard left, you know, those are, are really smaller and smaller uh, percentages of the population. I'm saying, you know, just ballparking it, it's probably all getting aside maybe 10 to 15 percent on either side. That's what I was going to say. And, and the rest is just it's really in the middle itself. Of course, the, the problem is that they're the most vocal. They're the folks that get the most attention. That's it's right. just like the media, you know, the, 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 the whole, you know, the Fox News and CNBC and, and, and you know, and, and MSNBC, you know, they only have 3 million viewership at the most. And think about it. There are 300 million Americans. And yet they're, they're, they're the ones that help set the agendas in many times or, or the newsmakers for only 3 million people, only 1% of the population watching. So... You know, it typically it is in life, right? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's that's what we're seeing here, both in politics and both in media. From your experience, whether it's president, senator, congressman, or woman, what is the number one reason why someone loses? Um, so a bunch of different political adages. These are great questions. Um, is the old adage is, it's never one thing that kills you politically. It's always death by a thousand cuts. Wow. And it's to this tipping point where, you know, you just continue. It's not that you vote to raise taxes. It's that you vote to raise taxes. You don't show up to vote. You know, you owe child support. You're, you get a DWI. 
You know, there are all these, or oh, suddenly all these things begin to pile on and people, Ugh, we're done. But you can't beat somebody with nobody. That's, that's the other oldest adage. Right. So you can say, this guy stinks or this gal is not really you know, the person we should have. Until you have somebody who presents an, a viable alternative. And that's, not, that's easier said than done. It's not like you just get somebody who's uh, shopping one day and suddenly say, oh, I'm going to run for so-and-so. And they come in. Because they don't, there's so much that goes into a campaign at, at any level. Of course. I mean, just take a look at what's happened in your home district with the, with the congressman. Yeah. You know, now everyone's coming out of the woodwork. They want to run against them. They expect them to be indicted. And by the way, if he gets indicted, it still doesn't mean he drops out of office. That's right. He might be censured and, and expelled right. by right. the Congress. But short of that, he's there you know, for the whole term. And, but you have all these people now who are stepping up. Uh, the former congressman, Tom Swasey, wanted to regain his seat. Uh, you have Republicans out there. But it's not like you can just suddenly emerge and say, elect me, Congress, because I'm not him. Because there's a lot of people who are saying, I'm not him. Right. But what's your message? How are you going to say that? And can you raise the money? Yeah. You know, can, can you get your message out? Uh, that's also, people are getting, I tend to get very cynical of, of uh, politics these oh, days. Oh, without a doubt. I think that's gotten much worse also. <clears throat> I, think it's the, I think it's the person that, sent, that can put a message out there that is so simplistic that a fourth grader can understand it in a very, very simplistic way that captures their audience is the one that really can move forward. It's, yeah. not, easy, it's not easy to do, right? Because there's a lot of difficult conversations and topics to, to speak about to, to the American people. But right. it's taking that complexity, and even like in finance and what I do for a living, it's so complicated. But if you don't, if you don't make it simple, clients are really not going to understand. And I think it's the same thing for politics. So, Michael, I want to I wanna, um, transition the conversation out to your business. So... So first, so you went, you were in government for a good part of your life, and then you decided to go into the private sector. How right. has that experience been? So I've, I've had this uh, company, Redline Strategies, for over 11 years. And, you know, when you're in office, you hear about, you know, the small business owner and how we have to protect the small business owner. Right, right. And that's, that has always resonated with me. But once you create your own small business. That's right. In to see, well, hey, whoa, whoa. I mean, I got to make payroll every week and I got to make sure all the taxes are done and all the workers' compensation and, uh, premiums are paid. And we got to continue getting clients and we got to, you know, and if clients leave, how do we replace them? Wow, that that is a ton to be able to do that. I'm thrilled to be able to say that, you know, a lot of times it's always hard to recreate your career or reinvent yourself. But the last 11 years have been has been just such a joy being able to have that kind of flexibility and pursue really interesting things and, and, and frankly provide, you know, food on the table for 15, 20 people. You know, that's, but, so no, it's it's small business, but that that's been very rewarding. Yeah. Which is incredible. It really is. I mean, as a small business owner myself, you, you realize the responsibility you have, you know, right. to your employees and, and doing all the things you said. So, you know, that's why government, I do believe in many respects caters to the small business owner in the right way. Uh, which is terrific. So, so tell me about your business. What do you do exactly? I'm going to say that three, three or four verticals. The, the first is that, you know, we, uh, uh, we do healthcare. And so I work with, with an agency, an association called Greater New York Healthcare Facility Association. We have about 90 nursing homes in this association, but we also work with a coalition of long-term care providers that has about 350 across the state of New York. So very interested, wow. obviously, you know, post COVID, you know, the long-term care, the nursing homes, they got devastated. And I saw that firsthand. And and just for me, you know, not for nothing, and if, if uh, the former Governor Cuomo was on the show, I'd say the same thing. In many respects, I think New York got it exactly wrong, but everybody did. You know, we the only thing that, that I have an issue with is that there was such certitude. This is the right way. There was never any doubt. We had this. No, that, that right. didn't. Nobody was 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 um, strong enough or brave enough to sit there and say, I'm sorry, we want to give you a definitive answer on these things. We don't have that because this is a brand new virus for us to, to understand. And we're still, nobody ever had that honest conversation with anybody. And maybe there are folks out there, some of your clients will sit there and say, no, you couldn't have had that conversation. People needed to be able to have some type of, of certainty in their lives. But, you know, just the way we did things in long-term care, just, just, an absolute disaster. So it's really recovering. And we're trying to, to make a case now. And I, I work very closely with the governor's office and, 
and folks in the legislature try to do that. The second piece is um, technology, uh, cybersecurity, um, cyber architecture, trying to make sure that uh, whether it's um, setting up the uh, – um, the firewalls, uh, working with the uh, best in class on that to make sure you know where your endpoints are and the Internet of Things and how that changes it and, and recovery strategies and how do you store stuff safely and you know all these things. And then I've actually had some experience with incident response. And the last is that we do emergency. We do crisis management, crisis communication. Uh, we do, I think we do really good tabletop, which is an exercise. We don't get everybody out in the field doing things. You actually sit around the table, you create scenarios, and then people come and respond. We got a chance to work with the MTA, both doing a, a uh, pandemic wow. tabletop for the pandemic and then doing an active shooter. And unfortunately, that was two or three months before an actual active shooter in one of the subway stations. So we've worked with a lot of companies, worked with a lot of agencies, and that, that's been very rewarding. That's terrific. So, Michael, this, this, idea, this idea of cybersecurity and the threat of cybersecurity, whether it's a country, whether it's a business – whether it's personally, well, what is your view? What is your view of cybersecurity, and, and is it going to get worse? In your opinion, so there are three long the shadows that can get worse. So, so there are three long shadows that have been cast on cybersecurity. Three long shadows, and um, the first is this whole artificial intelligence. You know, I, I think <clears throat> and it's, it's hard to sit there and say that. Um, I am being overly dramatic or, or just spouting hyperbole because artificial intelligence, certainly if unchecked, is going to have the most dramatic impact on everyday lives of the human race than anything we've ever seen. Why do you think – why, why is that? Because it is the very nature of artificial intelligence. Why is it such a challenge and such a benefit? Because it learns. It learns. It's not a repetitive – technology. It's not a, um, a business algorithm because you got to feed in information. This is, it can become independent in certain activities. The big question, of course, could it become sentient? Could it truly think for itself? Right. And a lot of people, you know, well, that's scientific, you know, I mean, it's science fiction. It's not real. More and more people are saying, look at the growth, look at the pace, look at what's happened in the last two years. Two years as to how artificial intelligence has become so incredibly robust. Yeah. And, and there's such basic planning things. You, know, so the, the, you should never use or never utilize artificial intelligence on an enterprise-wide basis unless you consider four aspects of it versus the governance. Who's going to govern what the AI looks at? <clears throat> the second is let's map its application. What's it going to impact? What processes will it impact? What, what questions will it answer? And then what you have to do is you've got to measure it. So is this, this is providing a measurable benefit? And is it, is it augmenting what we do? And the last is you got to manage it. And in fact, if you've given the wrong information or you haven't done, it's been incomplete information, and the outcome of the processes, the artificial intelligence is, is uh, redesigning for you is not working, Maybe you have uh, something that is uh, prejudicial, you know, discriminatory. Well, then you got to be able to you have that off ramp. See, people never talk about how to get out of something. They only talk about getting into something. So, and, but remember, I said there are three things, three long shadows. The second is cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a way to make payments that the that the current financial markets are not prepared to really regulate to really understand what the impacts are. And that means that gives the underground economy, the criminal economy, the, the place it needs to thrive. So yeah. that, that, and, and then the, the last piece is really quantum computing. So quantum computing is the ability to use um, uh, high powered computers to basically break any type of encryption algorithms that you have. You know, <clears throat> so those three things are really changing the conversations that relates to any type of cybersecurity. So do, so do you feel like the cyber attacks and the issues that we continue to talk about for, for quite some time now, do you think it proliferates and, and gets worse from here, or do you think it's something that's still controllable from a government level? <clears throat> I think that um, uh, there are, you know, I work with a lot of different agencies, uh, both private sector and uh, public sector, and what are the strategies to try to help things? And there are strategies, and there are ways forward, and, and 
you know, if you pay attention, so for folks who don't pay attention, it's so folks that don't patch, you know, their, their applications who have things that are just beyond life and there's no support on them and yet they continue to run them. Yeah, and you would be surprised, stunned at how many municipalities are still running stuff that should have been changed a long time ago. But in there lies the difficulty. First of all, it's expensive. You might not have the revenue to do that. And there is a, a, a technology gap of people to hire who actually know how to do these things. Absolutely. You know, and hundreds of thousands of missing individuals for jobs that we have in the tech sector. And if you're a small municipality or you're a county somewhere, getting people to come in and become your chief information security officer, just your chief information officer, really, really difficult. And you can't do it by yourself, right. which means you're going to have automation that's going to come in, which then really takes, you know, give the keys to the kingdom to this automated program because you don't have the ability to run it yourself. Right. Kind of how we get into the weeds on this whole, you know, if you're going to have a learning program, and we get so embedded and we don't really take a look at what this is going to mean in five years or, right. or two years, right. that's you get down the road and it becomes really dangerous. So as far as China, so w- w- what is your view on China and where we are in terms of security or, or just in general? So China has been telling the world that it's coming for the last decade. If you paid attention to what China has done, first of all, from its, from its military buildup, China has invested more money and built a larger military enterprise than any nation in the history of the earth in the last 10 years. Right. So what are they doing with that? And then, of course, you take a look at the militarization of the islands in the South China Sea, where 50% of your shipping from the world goes through. Second, they are saying, no, we are not playing in the, in the United States universe. We're going to create our own. So they're trying to replicate the World Health Organization from a Chinese perspective the World Bank, from a Chinese perspective. They're coming in, and, and Xi has said all things security. Now that he's broadened that definition of security dramatically. Not, it's not just about gates, guards, guns, and gadgets, or it's cybersecurity. It's all about how you interact in society. Many people are unaware of the fact that you have a U.S. corporation in China, on mainland China. There is a responsibility of Chinese citizens who work at that company to report on what technology, what information that that company has. And you can actually have agents of the Chinese government come and say, I want to see everything you're doing right now. So in terms of protection of intellectual property, you know, not so much. Uh, but, but China has been really, they, they have been wanting to be world players. They are world players. They are. And they continue to grow. They continue to grow. And, then, um, and when you look at Michael, if you don't interrupt, but when you look at Jamie Morgan, Jamie, Di- Jamie Dimon, Elon Musk, Nvidia Jensen, you know, CEO of Nvidia Jensen, um, those big players now being very vocal with the government, saying, "Hey, you know, we 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 got to stay tight with China. They're important from a, from a business perspective." Yeah. What are your thoughts about what 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 they're what they're trying to do? So I, I guess I have a, I have a very strong view about what they're trying to do. But what is yeah, your right. So, you know, I think President Biden has said uh, we are competitors and, and, and we're not going to be in, involved in confrontations, which for the world out there, that makes total sense. That, that's an incredibly reasonable perspective. Why would you want to shut off that world? Well, that's not what Xi and the Communist Party in the People's Republic of China, that's not how they see the world. It's, it's more than competition. It's, it's consolidation. It is, a, um, it is the ability to expand. I mean, look at, look at the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. Billions of dollars invested across the world in places like Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where you come in and we're going to build up this port. And now all the things that come in that we're going to get a piece of. Now, now they, they have a lot of debt as a result of that. And some people say that's part of one of the reasons why they're, they're struggling financially right now. Um, but they've gotten really big, really fast. And, and the, the, the question is, what is okay from a, from a market perspective of aggression? And what is something that really crosses the line and now becomes something that is uh, in a military, needs, needs a military response? And I'll just say, you know, from a cyber perspective, there has been theft of intellectual property through cyber with uh, Chinese-backed agents for you know, yeah. a very long time. Very long time. We have not decided yet what, what are the rules in cyberspace, you know, as to what constitutes a, a military action in cyberspace. 
It's an incredibly difficult, delicate, and important question. We haven't been able to figure that out yet. I'm sure it is. Um, so as a business owner, what should, <clears throat> should, what should we be aware of as it relates to security and cyber? So um, I, one of the things that I think a lot of people overlook is that there are, you know, there are five things that, that result in cyber insecurity. So the first is uh, weak, uh, leaked, weak, or uh, simple passwords that can be corrupted. It is unpatched assets, you know, uh, insecure assets. It is misaligned applications. Those three things are uh, a huge issue. There's the insider threat. We have someone who now knows how your network operates, knows right. the system, has access to, to um, your server rooms, and now goes and does something bad. And then the number one way that people are compromised is through social media, is social engineering. Wow. And, you know, this, this phishing scam. I'm going to go in and, and here you go. It looks just like your bank talking to you. And now click on this. And they're all rules, you know, like your bank, the IRS. Nobody would ever ask for your specific information through an email. You know, it, it, trust me, if the IRS is coming at you, you're going to get a nasty gram in the mail. And it's going to tell you these different things. Or you're going to get, you know, a visit. And it's not going to be someone you know, uh, through email saying, send us all your information, you're in trouble. That, that's not the way it works. But right. there are different levels of sophistication of owners. The other thing is that, you know, this is not your day job. You're just really looking to make a business. Right. And grow. So to sit back and say, now I've got to worry about this. And this is cybersecurity is not a, a, it's a cost center, not a profit center. And a lot of times that when you look at the bottom line, that's a very difficult concept. You know, why should I have to do this? Why isn't the federal government, if this is a nation state actor that's attacking me, why isn't the federal government protecting me? That's kind of a valid question. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think, I think that there, if you take a look at those five things and you begin to work through them, um, you'll make yourself uh, much safer than it, than certainly if you don't. Uh, but you also need to have a seriousness. Uh, cybersecurity begins from the top. You know, if you're like just in phishing. So you have all these, you know, uh, these tests that you put your employees to. Well, if somebody continues to fail, link, you know, click on that link after being told, don't click on that link. Right. At the point in time, you get to sit and say, you know, you, you were providing a threat to, the, to our very viability, and therefore you can't work here anymore. But that, again, that's if it's a talented employee, better said than done. You know, that, that's, that's great for the textbooks, but when it comes to actual practice, very difficult. To very difficult. Of course it is. Of course it is. And, and Michael, to finish off with the debt limit that we're talking about right now, right? It's my concern is not so much passing this debt limit. I, I believe they will. However, it's more the bigger concern, which you probably can imagine, but I'm going to say right now, is the quantity of debt that we've accumulated as a percentage of GDP. We're at historic numbers, you know, going back to post World War II or, or right at World War II. How, in your view, knowing government, et cetera, how do we fix this, in your opinion? So, one of the things that, that disappointment, disappoints me and worries me very much about this entire conversation from the Fed is that you don't really see much F at all a reference to the, the COVID spending as one of the, the key drivers of inflation. You don't see that. And yet we know it is. So where is the adult in the room to sit there and say, you know, we had to get out of COVID. We had to do these programs. But now we had, you know, you've got quantitative easing. Well, well how about quantitative, you know, pulling things back? Now we sit there, everyone sits there and says, no, 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 you can't do that. The Fed's trying to do that. They're trying to reduce uh, the inflation. And in fact, you know, I, I just heard that in, the, in, I think it's in the uh, July, the next Fed meeting. June, uh, June, July, June, 13, June 13th, yeah. Now a 60% chance of an increase. Yes. Two months ago, there was a 20% right. because yeah, we're very, Fed, very, very, right. we're going to pause. We're going to pause. Well, now he's not saying we're going to pause anymore. Right. Because you still have these inflationary numbers. And, and, and that, is, that is a big concern. Now, people sit there and say, well, wait, look at the market. You know, if, if we, we got to protect the market at, all, at, 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 at any cost. And yet you take a look at balance sheets, a lot of company, companies, this is not 2008. Right. A, lot of, a lot of companies have a lot of money that's kind of still sitting on the sidelines, still looking to be invested. The question is, where do you go with it? Right. You know, and then, but then you've got, you know, the, the headwinds. You know? So you've got the uh, SVB, right? Uh, and you have the 
um, Signature Bank, and you have all these other banks, and then you have the real estate market, right. particularly in cities like New York and Chicago and L.A. Right, particularly what, those states, particularly those what, states. Right. What happens when those real estate market, when those mortgages and leases you know, come up? And in this tight credit market, who's going to refinance? You already have stories, and you know, I don't know how real they are, but of, of, of REITs turning back the keys to, the, to some of the banks that said, that say, you know, we're not going to operate these anymore. And, and that's obviously a huge concern. And what do you do with these buildings? <clears throat> really, you can just you say, oh, turn it into, you know, turn an office building someplace where people live. Oh, well, that's a lot of money. <clears throat> that's a lot of and money. It and it takes time. It's the, it, it's the, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, right? right? So I think that's a huge that that's a, that's a huge impact for the economy in the short term and the long term. Absolutely. So as far as the debt, as far as the quantity of debt that we have, do, do you ever see, do you ever see this being fixed? I mean, and and how do you see it being fixed? I think you know as a always oh, what, what's the measure was a percentage of GDP, right? You know that that's always the the, the that's benchmark. the big one, right? Exactly. We're like one hundred and two percent. You know, <laughs> right. And Japan, Japan is over two hundred fifty percent, right? So, uh, yeah. You know, and so, <clears throat> what 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 happens? You know, traditionally there are laws in place. It's called bankruptcy, and then you go and you, you start again, and you you pay your your debtors a certain percentage. And well, that that's a default. That's a, the United States can't do that. But what is, what is the ripple effect down for businesses? Uh, that's the, that's the so, that's, yeah. It's like a dead end. It's literally like it's literally like a dead end. It really is. No. What do you, I, I don't see any near-term solutions right now, but that's why, oh, can you decide, whoever the next leader is, they need to really have the capability and the talents to be able to guide this world through. And we've got to start stop the partisan bickering. Yeah, we really, I think that's, I, I, that is that is definitely number one, because, you know, for example, fixing the debt issue that we currently have is, is going to help everyone, right? right? It's going to help everyone. So you really have to come up with a game plan to try to be able to do that. And that's, and I mean, it's definitely not easy, but something has to be done. And and, and you just got to, you have to do things that it's not going to be <clears throat> correct. And, and people, and, and you know, you're going to upset some people, but that's got that it's in life. If you want to be a leader, this is, these are the things that you need to do. So, so, so Michael, this has been really, really terrific. I, I appreciate your time today. You were absolutely excellent. Um, if you want to put anything else out there about your business, you know, feel free to do that. I just hope that your, your viewers, your listeners are not sitting here going, who is this guy? This Balboni guy? He doesn't have an economic guy. What's he talking about this stuff for? Because I'm a you know, security guy and a government guy. But no, you're more than. Um, that. It's great to have this different perspective on things. And That's I will true. tell you that we've spent a lot of time, a lot of time, uh, looking at AI and the applications, looking at the threat of China as well as Russia and what's going on in Europe, and then taking a look at how the overall markets, the overall economy, create security challenges. Not just for the United States, but for societies across the world. Right. Absolutely. We're studying that. Yeah, that's good stuff, Mike. Well, listen, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for serving our country. Uh, appreciate everything and, and look forward to seeing you soon. Very good. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you.